Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is Plans to Defund the Federal Government. In 1974, there was a, uh, a term that was used called impoundment. In fact, there was the 1974 Impoundment Control Act. And uh, that was passed for a reason. And the reason being is that Congress had set forth money in the Clean Water Act. And President, then President uh, Richard Nixon decided not to fund several key uh, important projects in New York City, uh, specifically to efforts to clean up water supply and um, discharge of sewer. And these, uh, these withholding of monies went all the way to the federal courts and ultimately to the Supreme Court. In a unanimous decision, it was found that Richard Nixon had indeed violated uh, a, 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 a primary responsibility to Congress, and that is to hold the purse strings of the nation. And in this specific case, it was the Clean Water Act that Richard Nixon was trying to defund or withhold from. Uh, let's fast forward to uh, today. Trump's website is saying that he wants to reimpose the act of impoundment which is to say withhold funding for things that Congress has already approved and has set money forth. To discuss this topic is my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh. Jay, to you, uh, Donald Trump is basically, as we have said in the last seven years, trying to pick around the edges, the fringes of the Constitution, and trying to um, enhance the power of the president of the United States and specifically the power of Donald Trump. Uh, this looks like a open invitation that he's, he's pre-announcing that he wants to do exactly that. And that is to uh, compromise or hamstring the purse of the Congress. Your thoughts about Donald Trump's efforts that he's announcing well before the election. There's a uh, six part series on Netflix, Netflix called Hitler, uh, and the Nazis. And in, the, I guess, the first and second of the those series, you get a very well-researched, well-presented um, itemization of the steps that Hitler took um, to achieve power. He was a nobody. He was a, a, you know, an unemployed and unsuccessful painter in Vienna. And a few years later, he was running Germany um organizing the holocaust um running the government down and arguably you know destroying the liberal democracy that they had had after world war one and so um you know i guess we've all seen a lot of documentaries about hitler and how he rose to power now, the, the authoritative book was by william shearer and he is a central part of this documentary so we know it's authoritative um, but the other part is it goes into great detail and maybe with specific regard to what's going on today to show you what Hitler did to achieve power. One of the things is, you know, you need to you know, destroy the government as it is. You need to get people to agree with you that it's not functioning. Uh, you have to get people to agree that you can do it better. You can do it all. Um, and the government isn't really necessary. It isn't um, working well. And, and that's a sort of a, a modest statement of what was happening in Germany and, and what Trump is saying. But the parallels are, in, you know, are undeniable uh, that what is happening with Trump today and what was happening with Hitler in the uh, 20s and early 30s, um, they run a very close parallel. One of the things is you, you have to reach out and have people agree with you that things aren't working well. Even if they are, you have to lie, which is we know is happening with Trump, and it happened with Hitler. So what I get out of this, to answer your question finally, Tim, uh, is that he's following the same pattern, the same playbook. Remember, he spent a lot of time with Mein Kampf, and Mein Kampf has all this laid out in it. Um, so I think when he tells you that the federal government isn't working, when he tells you that Congress isn't working, even though it works for him, at least the Republicans do, when he tells you that it needs a strong leader who knows what's going on and who will do what has to be done um, and you know achieves popularity that way, or populist popularity, if you will, um, it's the same thing. 
So uh, I am very suspicious of Hitler's, excuse me, uh, Trump's efforts to increase his power on the budget, um, to deny what Congress does, if that's what he wants to do, and to spend money that Congress is not appropriated, if he wants to do that. He is marginalizing Congress on uh, trying to marginalize Congress uh, on a budgetary fiscal basis. Um, this is very dangerous business. You know, we know that the president has become more powerful over the years. It, it didn't start with Trump, but he's taking advantage of that. He's capitalizing on it, and he will further capitalize it if he gets into office again. Um, and this statement, you know, you can say he lies a lot, but he's real serious on this, um, and he is going to really muck up. At the same time, by the way, he's got all these programs that will um, um, reduce taxes, more reduction in taxes, and increase spending for certain things like the military. He's not going to change anything about the military. So the result is, um, you know, he achieved seven, an additional seven trillion dollars of deficit while he was in office. That's going to continue. And we're going to wind up in a crisis, a budgetary crisis. And that is something like Hitler. That's what Hitler did. He messed it up and then he blamed others. And then he said, I alone can fix it. And I think this is part of that same uh, strategy. Let's draw, throw something into the mix here, and that is, how has Donald Trump, or at least this website that's reporting that he wants to take control over spending or, or to wrestle away some of the authority that Congress has on spending, how is that different from, say, Barack Obama uh, with executive orders, uh, Donald Trump with his executive orders, President Biden with his executive orders, on programs and spending. Uh, do you see a difference between executive orders and what Donald Trump is proposing to do here? No, I was thinking about that and thinking about this show. You know, it's not that this hasn't happened before. It has. It's been a, a growing problem. And it's been a growing reason for more power to the president. However, this is Trump. This isn't Obama. It's an attitudinal thing. Um, and that makes it different. And for the rest of my answer, I'm going to concede my time to Chuck Crumpton. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to interject a question for Chuck. And Chuck, let's go down memory lane in the Trump administration and recall that the first impeachment actually revolved around the fact that he he took funding or he 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 failed to disperse funding that Congress had appropriated for the defense of Ukraine. And uh, he tried to enact a quid pro quo with uh, Zelensky uh, to get dirt on Joe Biden. And um, that didn't work out so well for Donald Trump. It did result in his first impeachment. To what degree will that issue rear its head up if he becomes president again and he decides to not follow the, the direction that Congress has set forth with funding of uh, multiple programs and or Let's say, for example, the Ukraine war. Will we have a repeat of an impeachment and or to what degree does this go to the federal courts and the Supreme Court? First of all, only the House can initiate impeachment. And unless control of the House shifts from the Republicans to the Democrats in November or in January, um, that's not going to happen. I mean, the Republicans can't even pass their own stuff because they're so divided. So hey, getting concerted action on something out of the Republicans, other than maybe holding Merrick Garland in contempt uh, because he expressed some contempt for them, so they want to contempt him back. And are they going to do anything that's going to mean anything? I don't think so. Um, they haven't for a long time. Uh, they're kind of self-destructive in the sense that they're divided, they're not likely to win a sufficient majority of anything to be able to get the kind of control that they would need to have to be able to run roughshod. Hey, and that's why Trump's talking about hey, knowing that the Republican Party itself and the Congress cannot be effective at implementing his wishes. So I'll just do it myself. What would you expect? 
That's what narcissists do. I had conceded some of my time to Chuck, but he didn't, he didn't apparently take it. So I'll just continue. Um, you know, there's this article by Robert K Kagan uh, in, in the Post, I think, um, which is really a, a, a work of art. Um, and, and he describes the environment around Trump. Um, the people who Trump will select have have has selected um, his efforts to control, as you said, Chuck, um, the Congress, um, and he is a busy boy, and and so it, it goes to a question of attitude. Even though we know the general direction of the presidency is to be more powerful, which is not a good thing. If a, if the founders were here today, they would say, no, that's a bad idea. You know, you've got to you've got to maintain a separate branches of government. And when you give more power to the president to either stop, you know, funding appropriations that have been made by Congress or start funding by himself, this is a really bad idea, in, you know, because it's the power of the purse. And so what I'm saying is, if you read this article and I urge everybody to read this article uh, from uh, Kagan. Um, you will see that the environment for Trump is completely different than it was for any prior president. And he is likely to take huge advantage of, of a thread that we have seen, of a, a possibility that has been expanded in prior, prior administrations. He's likely to take it to the moon, given the fact that he is likely to take everything to the moon. This is only one part of it. Um, but if you look at all the other parts, you realize that he's real serious about controlling the money. Chuck, I'm going to read a couple of quotes to you. But before I do, uh, again, the, the 1974 Empowerment Control Act was basically in direct response to uh, Richard Nixon's attempts to take away authority from Congress. Yet in this first quote I give you, um, he basically has done a 180 on, on the power of that law, the 1974 law. And I'm going to read it to you and get your reaction. Uh, Donald Trump says, I will use the presidential's long recognized impoundment power to squeeze the bloated federal bureaucracy for massive savings. So in that quote, he says, I'm going to use my president presidential power of the empowerment act which is directly opposite of what the Powerman Act is. It's to restrict the, the president of the United States. Your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have to remember that there are some limitations on Trump's cognitive abilities. One of those is literacy. When he was very critical of the Korean film that won Oscar for Best Picture, and the media asked the director, oh, what he thought of Trump's, Trump's criticisms. He said, hey, you know, I can't be that bothered by somebody who's not even literate. So that's a limitation that he has. Uh, he doesn't read. He clearly doesn't read teleprompters. Otherwise, he could go without two minute breaks in being able to actually articulate a phrase which he isn't anymore. So one of the things that is significant here, Trump appointed 234 federal judges, including three Supreme Court justices. His sole use and purpose for them is to delay, stall, and obstruct any ability to restrain him from the completely unfettered abuse of power for self-interest. That's his only purpose for the judiciary. So he doesn't need Congress to do anything. He actually needs them to do nothing because he will exercise catch-22, which is you can do anything to anyone if nobody stops you. If Congress doesn't stop him, then only the judiciary could. He's appointed 234 federal judges. He doesn't need them to enforce what he does. He just needs them to stall any attempt to obstruct what he does. That's 
I think, strategically, the question we now no longer have not even three co-equal branches of government. We don't have three functioning branches of government. And Trump has assured us that in his particular equality-seeking mode, he wants to make sure that the executive is as non-functional as the other two branches. Mm -hmm. He's capable of achieving that. That's a great point. Very good point. He's a master of dysfunction. Yeah, and he's weakened the entire federal government and democracy by doing exactly what you just mentioned. Absolutely. Thank you, Chuck. That's a good observation. Uh, Jay, I'm going to finish the second part of this quote and get your reaction. Um, Trump says, regarding the uh, his ability to uh, turn around the Empowerment Act, uh, he said, this will be in the form of a tax reductions for you. This will help quickly to stop inflation and slash the deficit. Now, you had just mentioned that Trump and his administration increased the national debt $7 trillion. Um, I don't know if that's hypocrisy or not, but now he's claiming how he's going to reduce the deficit and the national debt. Uh, is this a populist stand that he's taking? And will he gain support not only of his MAGA followers, but uh, those who are not exactly excited about federal government and how it rears his head in the lives of daily Americans. Will he, will he pick off independence with this kind of quotation? Yes. You know, and uh, by the way, it, it bundled in that is this notion um, of um, not taxing tips uh, to service Correct. workers. Okay. So he's trying to get votes. He's campaigning. He's coming up with a platform point. The problem is um, that this is going to cost the government money. He's going to he's going to hamper or defund the IRS. It will be very hard for the IRS to actually go out there and collect money. Uh, he's on the one hand, he's going to reduce the amount of income to uh, to the government, um, and on the other hand, um, he is he is he is going to increase his own dedicated spending. So what I get out of this um, is that, he, yes, he's trying to get votes. He's trying to give give everybody a break, especially the wealthy, because he's going to continue the, uh, the you know, the uh, Tax Reform Act, and I put reform in quotes, of January 2017, which he forced through Congress immediately after his inauguration with the help of Paul D. Ryan, then Speaker. Um, he, uh, he, he he wound up um, giving great benefits to the wealthy and not so not so great benefits to to everyone else. Uh, the one percent against the ninety nine percent. There's a, a sunset on that bill for five years, and that comes up early in his next administration. Um, and he's definitely going to extend it or make it worse. So he's going to make big tax reform, same kind, um, to uh, help the wealthy and maybe not so much anyone else. He's going to reduce the income to the Internal Revenue Service and the government, and he's going to have control over what goes out, whatever Congress says. Uh, and indeed, Congress may not say anything. So, you know, what I get on this um, is that, yes, he's trying to get votes, but no, he has no clue about fiscal policy. And he will ultimately get us into a uh, an accelerated um, uh price, um, accelerated inflation, um, and he will get us into a situation where we don't have the money we need to operate the government. And, and, that, is, and that is exactly what he wants, isn't it? And that, that comes from the original strategy, James Buchanan, who started all this, and, and the Koch brothers back when, um, to reduce the, you know, the libertarians, if you will, um, who have, have sort of kidnapped the federal government um, to, re to reduce it. Um, indeed, I remember that uh, Josh Green went to Washington shortly after he was elected, um, and he noticed that the halls of these various um, departments were empty, and that already Trump had, had stopped hiring people, had somehow diminished um, the administrative state, um, and he's continuing to do that. He's shrinking government. He's shrinking 
you know, the social safety net. He's doing it. Uh, he had he had done it during his first term, and he will do it, you know, to a fairly well during his second term. So this is all part of a plan. And as I said before, if you look at what Hitler did, you find that Hitler created these crises and then um, entered the platform to say that he would solve them, that he alone could solve them. This is all an echo. Mm -hmm. What do you see the um, Biden campaign doing to counter this populist position of reducing bloated government? I mean, Democrats, Republicans, independents, they all agree that government's bloated and it's been, you know, that, that populism has been around for about 40 years. Um, do you see the Biden campaign stepping in to try to, to counter this argument? First, populism came about in the 19th century, in the, in the last years of the 19th century. That's where it started. And it's, mm -hmm. it's been a part of American political culture ever That's since. Nice. And, and, and it's a problem. Um, do, do I think that um, this will help him on the campaign? His campaign? Yes. Do I think it will help Biden on his campaign? I, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't think Biden has a ready answer um, for these uh, populist views that Trump is expressing. Um, he's got all these people around him who are acolytes, uh, policy acolytes, if you will, repeating what he says, going further than what he says, um, telling us what Trump is going to do in the next term. And Biden is not really responding to that. He's saying, look, I do a good job. I do the right thing. And you guys should understand, you should appreciate that. But he's not appealing to the populist mentality. He's not appealing to the base. He's not appealing to people who don't read the newspapers or know what's going on. <clears throat> this, again, is an echo of what happened to Germany in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Chuck, your, your response to what Jade has said, and, and do you think the Biden campaign is slow to react, slow to move? Um, and I'm thinking specifically on this proposal about uh, not taxing tips. I mean, I can't think of how many young people are in the service industry, and this is a, a godsend of a statement that Donald Trump has delivered that uh, falls not on deaf ears for the younger generations that are in the service industry, but a real, a real attaboy, uh, you know, a, a, an open applause for that audience. Your thoughts? I think that's a, it's a symptom, but it's not a big one on the spectrum. It, more significant, I think, look at who Trump is trying to serve by these policies. The sole primary foreign policy objective of taking control of and cutting off federal funding is to enable Putin to take unrestrained control of Ukraine and subject it to whatever cruel, inhumane dictatorship he chooses. That's his gift to his buddy. He's on a short fuse. He's got to do it within his next term, because unless he changes the law and the Constitution, he's not going to get another one. It's not... You don't get three terms just because they're interrupted by a term in between, unless he changes the law. But he could do that, too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, one, he wants Putin to win. If Putin wins, there will be literally no restraint uh, on Xi and China, uh, not only in Taiwan, but in the entire East Sea, South China Sea, West Philippine Sea, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that portion of the world, uh, which falls within Trump's categorization uh, of shithole nations, uh, he doesn't care about. Putin, she, you can have those. It's okay. Uh, in return, just make sure that you continue the disinformation support that enables me to swing just enough voters to win electoral votes, even if I can't win popular votes. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, hey, your question, are the Democrats slow to respond? I think the question is first, 
since they have not yet responded, will they respond at all? That sounds slow. It's just, will they or won't they? Because the ultimate question for the Democrats is the one we've talked about. Will they have the vision, the intelligence, and the courage and the character to simply present the people of this country with a clear and irrefutable understanding of the consequences of the choice that they face in November? The educational consequences, the healthcare consequences, the governance consequences, the environmental consequences, the climate change consequences, the housing consequences, and the labor and employment consequences, among others. Mm -hmm. Every well, sector of society. That leads me into what he has stated on his website that he would go after if he was elected president again. That is, um, he's going to go after clean energy. He's going to go after international aid, uh, the World Health Organization, and um, also the education department, as far as either slashing that severely. And one that I, I take note with is the Department of Interior. Remember that uh, he, he was in front of an oil audience of executives and said, um, you need to contribute to my campaign because I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of the oil industry. Well, the Department of Interior has a lot of public lands that I'm sure the oil industry would love to get their hands on. Um, can you imagine what else other areas of our government or and or our foreign policies that Donald Trump would uh, take delight to did you fund? Sure. Health care. Mm -hmm. Right. If you want health care and you're not in the one percent. Hey. Don't vote for Trump because you won't have it within a fairly short period of time. He won't need the Congress to repeal Obamacare. He won't need a judiciary to de-enact Obamacare. He will simply defund it. It won't be there because there won't be money to pay for it. Okay, He can do that. He is attacking not only higher education, but education generally, because somebody in the Trump camp figured out that what happened in the 1960s and 70s is that education's constituency, the students and the faculty, and eventually the administration, allied together to fight for civil rights and peace. And eventually with them came their families the communities, the workers. And eventually with them came the media. That combination of the constituents of higher education, the families and communities of those constituencies, and the media that covered those constituencies, because they're much more interesting to cover than any of the other sectors of society. That alliance effected change in civil rights, and in foreign policy as to peace. Unfortunately, with Reagan's advent in 1980, we let up. Our generation has now handed the next generations not only a world and an environment and a living situation and choices that are not as good, they are infinitely worse. I am embarrassed and ashamed to face my children, my children's children, and their generations, and acknowledge to them that working within the FCC linguistic constraints here, we have screwed this up beyond all recognition. This is FUBAR to the max. Okay, thanks. You know, as you were speaking, I was thinking of Chairman Mao in the uh, Ch China Cultural Revolution, the first target were the professors and the academias. Um, they were they were targeted right off the bat, and for the reasons you just cited in your your discussion piece here, uh, Jay, can you same think thing of, in Hong Kong? Same thing. Same yeah. thing in Hong Kong, and the students, the, the dissident student leaders as well. Jay, can you think of other areas that uh, Donald Trump would lick his chops over as far as slashing and burning? and what that, uh, what that might look like as other agencies and or initiatives in, uh, currently taking place in our federal government. Well, I think we, spend, we need to spend a little more time on the vengeance 
um, a, a vengeance uh, initiative that he's going to implement as soon as he's elected. He's got a little list, actually. It's a big list. And he's going to go after these people. And he's going to have control of the newly organized IRS, Department of Justice, FBI, and the military. <clears throat> and if you want to go out in the street and uh, protest what he's doing, he'll He'll uh, he'll call he'll call up the military under the Insurrection Act. So what I'm saying is uh, there's going to be vengeance to a lot of people. It won't just be the academicians and the students. It'll be anybody who's ever criticized him. And to go back to uh, Hitler and the Nazis, uh, you know what Hitler did is he he took out and I mean killed um, people who were actually loyal to him, but he suspected would not be loyal in the future, were not part of his plan, like the SA, the stormtroopers. He, he nearly, quote, nearly disbanded them, and he killed the leader who had been uh, completely loyal to him in, in organizing his, his military strength for his takeover of, of Germany. And so um, I think the most the, the thing of most concern is the vengeance program, because that will include everybody who has ever criticized him, everybody who um, he feels would criticize him in the future. Um, it will include the media. Um, and at the end of the day, if he takes the same approach as uh, Hitler did, they will all be silenced one way or the other and possibly through very brutal efforts. And I think that's part of his plan because <clears throat> you can't do some of the things that he says he wants to do without doing away with those who would criticize those things. So you know, they, they have to work hand in glove. You know, I, I, I was thinking, you're, you just uh, popped up a memory for me and that was, remember during COVID and the issuance of pandemic uh, funds to uh, all the states in the country? Well, did he kind of uh, delay or hold up some of the funding to those governors that refused to grovel before him? Uh, didn't he use pa pandemic monies uh, as a kind of a, a leverage or as a weapon uh, to try to gain more, um, more loyalty out of these governors? Yes, uh, every t technique available. You know, you think, for example, that some of the democratic governments from blue states would oppose some of these initiatives and like would refuse to abide by his um, you know declarations uh, as a dictator but then remember he knows how to attack them he knows how to attack them from the top the bottom and the side they will not be able to stay in power and resist him after he's in office so i, I i'm saying and just repeating what i said before namely um, that he will find a way to silence all the voices against him and, and do what he wants. Quick example. If Gavin Newsom were to say, eh, we are not going to sue or prosecute doctors who perform abortions, uh, Trump would send whoever he wanted to against them, not only military or law enforcement, Proud Boys, whoever. It only takes one to take out one. Mm -hmm. well, gentlemen, at his disposal are not limited by the rule of law. When he was convicted, all of his allies and supporters said, oh, well, if it's Trump or the rule of law, the rule of law has to go. Good point. Excellent point. Um, gentlemen, you realize we're not painting a very rosy picture here for our future. Uh, with that, I'm going to go around the table and get your last thoughts. We've run out of time. Go ahead. Chuck, you first. Three word phrase. Remember in November. When you go into that voting booth, whoever you are, whatever your life looks like, think of the most important choices in your life for you and the people you care about the most. <clears throat> and think who is going to try and protect those choices and who is going to take them away. It is a clear, indisputable difference. Understand the choices, understand the consequences, and make a choice. 
All right. Thank you, Chuck. I think I've, I've heard you say that before, and it's it, those are wise words. Um, I think that in combination with uh, motivating people to get out of their Barca lounger and register and vote and realize what's at stake. So excellent point, Chuck. Thank you. Uh, Jay, your final thoughts or, or words. Read the article by Robert Kagan. Um, Kagan's article is as scary as it gets because he he describes um, gee, all the things that Trump has done, that Trump will do, Trump's acolytes will do. And the fact, and I'm sorry about the voting booths, you know, the fact that the Democrats are not likely to vote as much as the Republicans, the GOP is likely to vote. Um, and I think we're in for a terrible, terrible time. And, uh, you know, this is the calm before the storm, gentlemen. When we get to November, December, January, we're going to have a different world. And that world is going to be threatening to every single one of us, including the people who should have voted against Trump. Okay, I'd like to just add that the title by uh, Kagan is a Trump dictatorship is increasingly inevitable. We should stop pretending. And I believe that was published, uh, looks like November 30th, 2023. And um, I've read the article, it's, it's rather lengthy, but guess what, every word is pertinent and important. So Jay, thank you for um, reminding our audience that that is a critical article to read. And it's-, and, it's and Remember too, even if Trump loses the popular vote and the electoral vote, as far as he's concerned, that means nothing. It's not over. Good point, Chuck. I want to add one more point, Tim. Yes. One of the lessons after the beer hall putsch, where uh, Hitler tried to take over the German government by force, one of the things he learned is you can't take over a democratic liberal government by force. You have to work from the inside. You have to start your approach inside, play according to the rules or apparently according to the rules, and then corrupt it from the inside. And I suggest to you that's exactly what's happening now. Also suggest that uh, his popularity soared once he was imprisoned. Yes. All right. This is American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. I'd like to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel, and my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, for an engaging, intelligent conversation. And until next week, aloha.